to continue now with going over the 42 objections to uh, speaking in tongues and, and what you may hear. And I think we've all heard some of these objections along the way. And they've given the, the correct answer to use uh, the best that, that we can. And it really is an in-depth explanation of how to answer somebody uh, with this objection. So we're on objection 22. And here we see the objection is tongues can be counterfeited. We know speaking in tongues is not the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Satan can so easily counterfeit the sign. Of all the gifts of the Spirit, speaking in the tongues is the easiest to counterfeit. I'm sure we've, we've heard that. It would appear that God forgot to warn us about Satan's ability to counterfeit in tongues because at least it doesn't appear in the Bible. Point two, but we can agree and do agree, however, that tongues could be counterfeited. So what? As mentioned in 19 and 21, it's possible for people to counterfeit salvation by merely speaking words that sound like they're receiving Jesus in their heart. In Acts 5, 8, 5 through 24, we see all things that Simon was able to counterfeit while being accepted as the great power of God. Yet the scriptures point out that he bewitched people and used sorcery like Satan. All counterfeits must copy something real and valuable. That's the key. Mm -hmm. If there's a counterfeit that the devil is doing, there has to be the true aspect of it. So if he's counterfeiting the tongues, you're really confirming that there is the true speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. So all counterfeits must copy something real and valuable. Satan's whole purpose is to try and counterfeit God's program. He has done that with every step of the way and every 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 good thing that God gives man. But without that changed life, true saving power of Christ, there still exists a real life in God through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever seen anyone counterfeit a shopping bag? Why not? <laughs> so, objection 23, love is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, of course, the objection to love is the most important thing, not speaking in tongues. Love is real evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Who said love can't be counterfeited? A smile and hug are easy, easier than speaking in tongues to be counterfeited. In 2 Corinthians 6.6, 6, let's read that because this is a new verse that we have not yet read in our study. 2 Corinthians 6.6, 6, and we've, we've looked at a lot of these verses throughout this objections these last two nights. That's why we haven't read every one of these, but this is a new one that we have not read. 2 Corinthians 6.6. 6. By pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Or genuine love is what Paul is referring to. So here Paul calls attention, or Second Corinthians calls attention to Paul's unfeigned love for the Corinthians. That is love that is not false or counterfeit. It's genuine love. In 1 Peter one twenty two, Peter quotes, saying, Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love. Again, a love that is not counterfeited. And again, in Romans 12.9, Paul said, Let love be without dissimulation. That means false pretense or deception or hypocrisy. So love can be fake and counterfeited also. And I will add right here that it is true that that love is important. Mm -hmm. That That's nothing right. works through a Christian life without love. That's right. Love is the gateway to faith. Love is the entrance to faith. Love is the entrance to anything that we desire of God. And that comes from a genuine, pure heart. But, as we went through here, that love can be also fake, can it not? Mm -hmm. It can be. So love cannot be the evidence of the of baptism of the Holy Spirit because it is faked, it's counterfeit. And if we love God and we love the Lord Jesus and we ask for the Holy Spirit, 
He's not going to give us something fake or counterfeit. Objection 24, a baptism of love. I received a baptism of love, not a baptism of tongues. Answered, if you received a baptism of love according to Scripture, that is fine. Now you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit according to the same word of God. However, we fail to find any baptism of love mentioned, but I do believe that there is a baptism of love. It's, it's that love of God that is poured out or shed abroad in our heart. And Jesus said he will baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I believe that fire is that baptism of love. It's that fire that, that in our heart. Um, objection 25. Faith is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we had love was the evidence. Now it's faith is evidence. I believe, uh, the objection would say, I believe faith is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If faith is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, why do Acts 2, 4, 10, 46, and 19, 6 all state that tongues is the evidence? Why doesn't the Bible give us at least one example of someone receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit with faith being mentioned as initial physical evidence? Of course, faith is needed <laughs> to open your mouth and to begin to speak, but it, faith is not the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Point three, true faith is needed and required in obeying Christ to be baptized. But my faith will produce initial physical evidence of tongues. And Mark 16, 7 says the tongues in, that speaking in tongues will follow believers. If a person believes God, he will speak in tongues. If he doesn't believe in God's word concerning tongues, then no tongues will appear. It's that simple. Objection 26. I didn't speak in tongues when I was sanctified. Objection. I know that I've been sanctified, but I didn't speak in tongues. If you know the Lord has sanctified you, that's wonderful. Now you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do not confuse being sanctified with being filled with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a cleansing from sin. Sanctification is. The baptism puts the Holy Spirit within the within. Sanctification takes sin out, so the sin is removed, and then the Holy Spirit comes in. We do not find any testimony of anyone in the Bible being sanctified in a climatic experience separate from salvation. <clears throat> Objection 27. Couldn't I get the baptism without tongues? And this is a common one that, you know, you've asked for the Holy Spirit, and and, you know, you prayed for it, and but yet you didn't speak in tongues. And do I, did I still receive that baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do I have to speak in tongues? Couldn't I get the baptism without speaking in tongues? Why don't you want to speak in tongues would be the question. I don't know if that's always the reason why. If God's Word clearly teaches that speaking in tongues is the normal and only pattern of initial physical evidence, a receiving, then why wouldn't you want to follow that pattern? There are only four reasons why a person wouldn't want to speak in tongues, and we saw these yesterday, but I, I don't believe these are the only four. It could be others. One is fear. I do agree with that. Perfect love casts out all fear. and Love is obedience to God's word. Ignorance. We haven't been taught the truth of his word like Pete demonstrated here on the board. I myself was a Baptist growing up as a kid as a Baptist church. Mm -hmm. Of course, I heard my whole life <laughs> tongues was of the devil. I had the wrong teaching of it. And so I was ignorant to God's truth for a, a long time. Pride. There's pride. And, and um, pride cometh before of the fall. And pride is a sin of the flesh. To remain in pride is to remain in, in sin. And so I'm not saying it is prideful, but it could be. Then unbelief. This is choosing not to believe the truth of God. Once you've heard it, it is willful act of sin. 
And so I, I just want to add something here to this unbelief. Choosing not to believe the truth of God once you have heard it is on it is willful act of sin. It has to go from the mind <laughs> to the heart. So you may have heard something in your mind. That doesn't mean you believe it. So we, we keep we hear the word of God, and faith comes by hearing. And so we may have an introduction to this, as we have started last night. So you may begin to hear something new. Okay, now you have it in your mind, but now it isn't in your heart yet. So you're still in the process of gaining information. Right? And so now, we, now we've gained all the information. Now you, now, okay, that is true. I see it now. Then not to do it would be because of unbelief. Then it would become sin. So I, I believe it's not just what you've heard. It, it has to be what, what is in your heart. The hearing part is that your mind is illuminated with light in God's truth. And now we have to process that truth. And as I said, there's, you know, I've known a lot of people that have gone through this Bible school, and, and they have a lot of head knowledge, but they never got it to their heart. Mm -hmm. They never have been able to walk out God's truth. Mm -hmm. And so don't be discouraged by that, by that word. If they've heard it, then it's a willful act. There's a time of processing that information of God's light. 28. Pete, would you agree with that? Yes, I do. 28. Not seeking the gift, but I'm seeking the giver. Objection. I'm not seeking the gift, but the giver. It's more important to have the Holy Spirit than have any of, the, any of his gifts. I want the giver, not the gifts. This sounds very like a very noble statement, but it's totally unscriptural. In 1 Corinthians 14, 39, I don't think we've read that, so let's read that one. Maybe Paul, Peter did this evening, but I don't remember it. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. So here Paul says to covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak in tongues. First Thessalonians 5.20 also says despise not prophesying. When a man says, I don't want the gift of prophecy, I just want the giver, he is despising prophesying. That's what he's doing. Hmm. If a man were sick and you were called to pray for him, just be, before you prayed, the man declared that he did not want the gift of healing in his body, only the giver, he would re be rejecting the gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit. Then wouldn't this reply border on insanity? In Romans 6.23 says that the gift of God is eternal life. Does this mean that a person wants the giver and not Jesus? <laughs> the giver Jesus but not the gift of eternal life excuse me God has given all the gifts lifted in his word to refuse any gifts of the manifestation of God is to refuse God this is merely false humility and self pride that will not receive more of God's light but wants to remain in darkness Objection 29, I'm willing to speak in tongues if God wants me to. Objection, I'm not, I'm not against speaking in tongues. I'm willing to speak in tongues if God wants me to. He knows where I live. Somebody's <laughs> 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 like word crack me up. Uh, answer, speaking in tongues is a privilege, not a burden or hardship. It builds up the spirit man with faith, confidence in God. It allows the Holy Spirit to pray through a man with a perfect prayer. Again, as Peter stated tonight, it's just another tool that God has given man 
to to have everything that man is that is needed to live a holy life. Again, this cop out sounds good, but it's full of pride. The Bible pattern for receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues cannot be changed by selfish man. Is this how you were saved without confessing Christ, or if you or if he wants me to confess him? Objection thirty. You might get a false spirit, and kind of went back to that other one that you know we might get a demon or something, a counterfeit. You might be very careful when at seeking the Holy Spirit, or you might get a false spirit. The objection, the objection is slander against the integrity and character of God Himself. Think about that, because you're 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 questioning God, the giver of the gift. He's going to give you something that is of a different spirit. So it really is you're you're going to question God, the gift giver. It's slander against His character. It implies that Satan is stronger than God and that God cannot protect his own gifts to mankind. Of course, and as usual, there is not one case in the Bible where such a thing happened, but this doesn't say stop Satan from using fear tactics to keep men from desiring and seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Point three, if there's such a great danger of receiving a false spirit, then surely God is smart enough to warn us in the Bible. Luke 11, 11 through 13, Jesus teaches us you can't get a false spirit from God. I think Pete said that was Mark, but we actually read it in Luke 11, 11 through 13 last night. If if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much is God able to give good gifts mm -hmm. to his children who ask for the Holy Spirit? So he's a good God. Mm -hmm. What is he going to give you if you ask for him? He's going to give you the genuine article. Mm -hmm. Objection 31. Five words of the understanding worth 10,000 in a non-known tongue. Let's read 1 Corinthians 14, 19. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So here we, we have the objection. Paul said I'd rather speak five words with my understanding than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. This is not what Paul said or meant is only part of the verse. Paul is referring to appearing in front of the church body and just speaking in tongues. Like I said to you last night, who would you, what would you profit? <laughs> Nothing. You would think, okay, I'm getting nothing. I'm not edified, but I was. So this is what he's referring to in front of the body. You know, we're going to speak words that are understood by others. We're going to speak our language that we can. That's why when we go to our Africa schools and some of them don't know English, we have to have an interpreter. Mm -hmm. Because when I'm speaking, they don't understand it. The people would not be edified. So we use an interpreter right. to speak in their own language so we all can be edified. Mm -hmm. So this is what Paul is referring to. He's not referring to the speaking in tongue part as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He's simply saying in front of the church body, five words in their own language would be better than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Mm -hmm. Paul is not against speaking in tongues. Only in chapter 14, he was distinguishing the difference between tongues in the church and tongues for individuals. Objection 32. Again, we have basically the same as we have saw before. Spiritualists and devil worshipers speak in tongues. Objection. Speaking in tongues cannot be the evidence of the infill with the Holy Spirit because spiritualistic mediums often speak in tongues during their seance. <coughs> and devil worshipers of Tibet, oh, I thought it was the Himalaya Mountains, and other heathen nations often speak in tongues. 
true, these things have and will continue to happen. A again, there's the counterfeit. Because the devil is counterfeit in something that is of the true. Because he wants to destroy the true in the lives of people that are seeking it. However, we are talking about the true word of God given by the Holy Spirit in which God teaches his believers will speak in tongues as a result of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Again, in the Old Testament, we saw the pattern in Isaiah 28 and Joel 2, 28, and also in John the Baptist, plus the teaching of Jesus, the fulfillment of Acts, and the confirmation of Paul show the full truth. Counterfeits come and go, but God's truth remains forever. Heathen and earth may pass away, and all the evil and counterfeits therein, but God's word will endure forever. If you got a $100 counterfeit bill, would you throw away the rest of your money? <laughs> would you? No. So, you know, this is the third time that we've looked at this, whether it be spirits or or demons, or spiritualists. Again, the devil is a copier, or a copier of God's true. What is his purpose for doing that? So he may rob those that are, that, that are considering it of the truth of God. That is his purpose, is to rob you of the truth, and to keep you from this baptism of the Holy Spirit. So he has a counterfeit. And you hear the stories all the time. Mm -hmm. But a counterfeit, there must be a true. A counterfeit $100 bill, there must be a true $100 mm -hmm. bill. Objection 33. It is a miracle of hearing and not of speaking. And this one maybe you heard quite a lot on the day of Pentecost. The miracle was in the people heard what was being interpreted. Objection on the day of Pentecost, the miracle is here, and the 120 spoke in their own language, but the multitude heard them in other languages. It was a here at miracle. But the Bible tells us differently. It says it was in speaking. In Acts 2 4, the Spirit gave them the utterance. Isaiah 28 11, 12 says it was in speaking. In Joel 2 28 and 29 says it was in speaking. Jesus taught it was in speaking from the from our belly. Paul in 1 Corinthians says the miracle is in speaking. Nowhere in Scripture does it teach that the miracle was in hearing. It was in the speaking of tongues. Now, I will say this, that twice in my missionary work, and it happened to be both times I was with my wife. Once was in Lagos, Nigeria, and once was in Kenya teaching uh, in the slum. And there were some women in the back in, in Kenya, and uh, there was a group of five or six, and we didn't have an interpreter. And so, so we were, you know, teaching in English, but they understood everything I said. Wow. They did. And same thing happened in Jesse's church in Lagos when we were teaching moral government. There was a group of women that couldn't understand English, but the Lord, they heard exactly what, and they, I knew it because they were asking questions. They would write them down, or somebody would write them down in hand, and is this what you meant? Yes. So there is that type of miracle that God allowed them to hear because there was no interpreter. I thought that was so wonderful, God. We've had cases where... People were illiterate and could not read, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the reading came. After the lady on hand. Yeah, so I'm not dis discarding that there is that type of miracle when the people heard what was being said, but that's not what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. The, the miracle is in speaking in an unknown language. I was speaking English. And they, heard, they were understanding what it was being said. <clears throat> Objection 34. Not all the 120 spoke in tongues. Objection. Not all the 120 on the day, day of Pentecost spoke in other tongues. All who spoke were Galileans. 
Among those present to hear what was spoken were Judeans. The Galileans and Judeans spoke the same language, Aramaic. Inasmuch as the Judeans heard in their own tongue, there had to be some who did not speak in other tongues, but spoke in their own tongue, Aramaic. That's a mouthful. The objection as well as others must be settled in God's word. Again, I like the way Bob had did this, wrote this out, because every time the objection has to be settled in our mind and in our heart in God's word, not a man's opinion or man's objection. And we have two law lawyers here that were defendants, and they understand about objections and how objections are worded. They're smooth, aren't they? I object, Your Honor, on this grounds. And so the objections seem logically and logical, but every objection here in this outline has to be settled in God's truth. And so this is what I, every objection we're doing has to be settled. God has to have the final answer, not man in his opinion. This objection as well as others must be settled in God's word. Acts 2 4 says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. How many were filled? Question? All. How many spoke in tongues? All. If they all spoke in tongues, and all or each of them spoke in a language that they did not understand. If someone heard their own language being spoken, it does not distract from God's fact that each spoke 120, or each of the 120 spoke in a language he did not know. How he could have also spoken language he did not know. The main emphasis is on languages not known. In the lexicon, the word for this tongue comes from the word gloss. Glossia, glossia. The, the, the definition in the lexicon is a foreign or strange language which one has not learned, but yet is able to speak it as a result of the supernatural intervention of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what happens. It's a language that is not learned by me, but as I, in faith, open my mouth, the words are formed as the Holy Spirit gives utterance. So this word, 1100, is used every time in tongues. It's the word glossia. And glossia means exactly that, a foreign language unknown to the speaker. And so it's not something learned. It can't be, if I knew... Uh, Hebrew or from New Greece, and I would speak that. That's not what it's referring to. It's a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit through the individual as he opens his mouth. Doris. Dr. Uh, Carolyn Leaf, help me, Pete, um, has done a study on how the, how, what, what impact or how the brain works with speaking in tongues. When you, when you learn a language, you, one side of your brain is, the logical side is is activated in devel uh, developing sentences and thought. When the Holy Spirit, when you're speaking in tongues, the other side is used. And, it, and it's not, um, it's that area that, it's the side that is not the logical side. I don't know what side it is. But it's... I, I remember back a long time ago, I would say this was in the late 90s, or maybe even early, I think it was the late 90s, 60 Minutes did a thing on speaking and praying in tongues. Really? Yeah, they did. And they had, and they had many language experts come in, and if someone would speak in tongues, they would say, yeah, that's a language. And then they had them hooked up to the brain, and they were saying what was going on in the brain. But that was on 60 Minutes. There's a whole segment on speaking in tongues. Uh, they, I think they did it to try to disprove it. But the experts came on that weren't believers that said, yeah, that's a language. That's not gibberish. I think they had three people that were speaking. So anyways, again, it's a, it's a language that is unknown to the speaker, but the Holy Spirit will give you that, the words. 
Objection 35. The Corinthian church was the only one to speak in tongues. Of all the New Testament churches, the church at Corinth was the only one that had the manifestation of tongues in their midst. Tongues were no doubt limited to this carnal infant church. Well, that's simply not true. (laughs) Tongues appeared in Jerusalem. Tongues appeared in Samaria. Tongues appeared in Ephesus. Tongues appeared in Caesarea. Also, in Mark 16, 17, tongues uh, followed the believers. So no church was without it. (laughs) Because the tongues were a sign that followed the believers. So that, that objection is very simply to, simple and easy to dispute. Objection 36. Paul wrote about tongues only to the Corinthians. It was only the church at Corinth, uh, Corinth that Paul wrote anything about speaking in tongues. There is no mention of speaking in tongues in any other epistles of Paul or the New Testament. Read 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 3. So let's do that, Gaylord. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can read in this first chapter that this letter to the Corinthians was not just to the church at Corinthians, but to all who call upon the name of the Lord. So when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, it was meant to be read and to be understood by all believers. We find also here in point two, how to get saved is only given in Romans 10, 9, and 10. Does this mean that no other church but the church at Rome was Paul given these instructions to? It is for all, all that in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is who this uh, gospel was, or this epistle was written to. Same as in Romans. Objection 37. Corinthians were living in sin and immorality. The church at Corinth was most carnal and sinful of all churches. They came drunk to the Lord's Supper. They had divisions among them, brother against brethren. It was here that false tongues movement started. Well, some of these things were true taking place in, in those that claimed to be part of the Corinthian church. These sinners, however, are not true members of the body of Christ. They're, why they are in sin. Therefore, the true church at Corinthians was still pure, and only born-again Christians who were free from sin were legal members of the church in the kingdom of God. I don't know if legal members fit the bill, but I would say they were true members, or true. Uh, they were the true body of Christ, the true bride of Christ, were those that were pure from sin. And if you think about that, we can say that about 90% of the churches in the the world today, that all this takes place in the church. But just because it takes place of sin and and ungodly people in the church doesn't mean that the rest of them are wicked. The truth still, we, we still are holy. Point two, proof that they were not all that way can be found in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 9. Let's read that. Unto the church, unto the church of yep. God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Verse 9. So they were sanctified. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So they weren't in sin. 
Verse 9. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so God was faithful to those that had been called. They accepted the calling. They were the called out ones. 316. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So again, here were some that were the temple of God. Uh, 6, 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Of course, he had just... Listed, do not be deceived, because mm -hmm. fornicators, adulterers, idolaters, mm -hmm. effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, or covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And some of you once were, but you've been washed. Mm -hmm. Then verse 19. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So not all in Corinth were wicked, and a lot of them were holy and sanctified in the temple of the living God. Point three, Paul gives strong rebuke to those angels of light that perpetrated themselves to be members of the kingdom of God, but were indeed synagogue of Satan. In every New Testament church, physical group, there was always some that A, had not truly been saved, B, were backslidden from the truth, or C, had totally apostatized into complete unbelief. The warning were for these rebels within, not the godly. Objection 38. Paul discouraged the use of tongues. All, all that Paul said about speaking with his tongue was by the way of rebuke, caution, warning, correction, and for the purpose of discouraging the use of tongues. I have no idea where they got this from, but it's false. As a matter of fact, the complete teaching in 1 Corinthians 14 is one of positive teaching of building up instruction and knowledge concerning the use of tongues. And we will look at that tomorrow night, verse by verse. Also, 1 Corinthians 14 contains a comparison between the gift of tongues and the manifestation, manifestation of tongues received by the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Paul teaches us on the difference between the two uses and do not teach, warn, or rebuke anybody against using tongues. Not one, and Paul was teaching how to properly do it in the church and what is right and what is improper. That is true. But he wasn't forbidding it. Mm -hmm. Not one scripture is given by Paul or anyone to teach against the use of tongues. It's all how to use them by Paul. Objection 39. Tongues forbidden without an interpreter. Paul forbids to speak in tongues if there is no interpreter. 1 Corinthians 14, 27 and 28. I don't think we've read that one yet, so let's do that. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. So here again, the answer, Paul is dealing with the gift of tongues for the use in the body of Christ. Not the ability to speak or pray in tongues for personal use. You must keep these two differences straight. And we will study this again in great detail the rest of the way. Especially when we get to the gifts and when we do the verse-by-verse -verse teaching. Jesus has already taught us where we should pray personally, our prayer closet, alone and private. I will add also in the church, because Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, so that most of our prayer in tongues will be done alone, in private in our home, car, or quiet place. We also might use our prayer language in a group with the Holy Spirit would lead us to pray or sing in other tongues and give worship and glorify the Lord 
as a church body. I can't say this word here in objection 40. Fanaticism. Fanaticism among Pentecostal people. God is not the author of confusion, as 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says, to let all things be done decently in order. We have, th we have seen things done in Pentecostal meetings that were nothing but fanaticism and wildfire and emotions. True, we have seen some very bad things take place in Pentecost churches. We've also seen bad things take place in non-Pentecostal churches. <laughs> Regardless where the bad things take place, it does still not set aside God's word and what he teaches concerning speaking in tongues. You can't use an experience as a as a as a proof of God's word. God's word should establish the experiences. So it's true that there is a lot of things going on that are not found in God's word. That is true, but we can't base doctrine on that fact. We only base it on the truth, and we find it when it comes to speaking in tongues that God. Uh, baptized us, Paul agreed with it, and the Holy Spirit will give us that language. Mm -hmm. Point four, bad things, counterfeit, false hods can never change the truth of God concerning a subject or doctrine. Objection 41, Pentecostal preachers who don't walk straight. We have known preachers who profess to have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, spoken tongues, who did not walk straight. Their lives were not right. We have known some who were nothing but reckless racketeers and were downright rascals. They were hucksters of holiness. I call them hucksters of holiness. Can I name some? You rascal, you wacky rabbit. True, we also know some rascal pastors and teachers. We also know many non-Pentecostal pastors who are evil. But yet again, this does not throw away God's word has to say about his doctrines and standards that he must hold. Anything less that would require is not God's. Get your eyes on God's word and off of men because they can fail you. Amen. Then finally, our last objection is not to seek the gift of tongues. Nowhere in the Bible are we told to seek the gift of tongues. If God wants to bestow the gift of tongues upon you, good, but you are not to seek it. On the contrary, we're definitely told to seek this very gift in 1 Corinthians 12, 31. So let's read that. But, but covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So the greater gifts, seek them. Here the word gifts means charisma, grace, favor, kindness, gratuity, aid, help, gift, covet, these things. However, again, do not confuse the gift of tongues with the manifestation of speaking in the tongues as a result of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, I just want to, again, emphasize that when you're dealing in Corinthians, Paul is talking about two different gifts and the distinguish between the two. One is your prayer language you had when you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke in a new language. The other one is how to use the gift of the Holy Spirit in a church setting in front of people, especially when it comes time to prophesy or to preach. And it's better than to speak five words that is understandable than 10,000 in an unknown language because nobody is being edified. Mm -hmm. And we and the, the purpose for God's church is what I believe is to build up and then to edify one another through the message, through songs of worship, and through fellowship to encourage one another. So as we go face the world... We're, we're strengthened and built up in our holy faith. So we have to remember that as we distinguish between these two different gifts. Point four, the gift of tongues is, is for use in the body of believers and must have an interpretation of tongues when used. The manifestation of speaking in tongues comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and is not referred to in the Bible as the gift of tongues. 
Therefore, we are not seeking the gift of tongues when we are baptized by the Holy Spirit, but merely receiving the ability to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gives us those words. However, we can still seek the gift of tongues as one of the nine gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, without sinning. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is something that we should all thirst be thirsting for. And that's what God wants us all to have is for that individual prayer life where we're filled with the Holy Spirit. For why? So that we may be a witness to God in this world. And I will, I will say that, again, there are two supernatural events that take place in the life of a Christian. One is the blood of Jesus cleansing your, cleansing your conscience of sin. There's nothing man could do to appease his conscience. Not one thing. We could do acts. We could give our money away. We could do whatever we wanted. But our sin and our conscience would still be remained until we repented mm -hmm. and called on the name of God in faith, of our Lord Jesus in faith, and then the blood of Jesus cleansed us from all sin. It took mm -hmm. something supernatural. Again, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of our salvation is the cleansing of our conscience by the blood of Jesus. The evidence of speaking in tongues is something supernatural. It's an unknown language that is not known to man. That is the evidence. Two supernatural events that take place. One is the evidence of our salvation, and the other is the evidence of us receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that concludes our objections tonight. So we can end here, boss.